Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if everybody can be seated, we'll get started. Well, first and foremost, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Mark Carrington. I'm the, a senior content manager with the Bloomberg BNA Plus team out of Washington, D.C., uh, and delighted to welcome you here today for creating material wealth for business owners and labor with ESOPs. Uh, between our sponsors, PKF O'Connor Davis, Prairie Capital Advisors and Sadis and Goldberg and other outstanding experts that we've drawn together, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We'll discuss the industries that are best suited for ESOPs and what employees stand to gain. We'll move on to how an ESOP can be used as a succession planning tool and why a company may want to choose that, uh, that route. And we'll wrap up with some of the more technical aspects of these plans and discuss recent legal trends and proposed tax changes. I should mention that we will move through the three short sessions without a break, but if you need to use the facilities, you can find restrooms behind us through the, uh, at that exit sign and through the exit sign on the other side. Uh, finally, let me remind everyone that we will reserve the final uh, five minutes of presentation time for your questions on the first and last session. The Wealth Creation Panel will take questions at any time during their session. So put your hand up to ask a question, and my colleague Betsy Garman uh, will rush to put a microphone in your hand. And with that, let's get started. Let me turn it over to Bloomberg BNA reporter and today's moderator, Alison Vespriel, who will introduce the first panel. Alison. Hi, okay, so this first panel is pretty short. Um, it's gonna be, it's called Identifying the Value Opportunity. So we'll get right into it. I'll go ahead and introduce our two panelists today. Um, on the closest to me, we have Christopher Mackin. He is the founder and president of Ownership Associates Incorporated in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Ownership Associates provides after the transaction assessment, training, and corporate governance services to companies broadly owned by their employees through employee stock ownership plans. And then on my far right, we have Bill Castellano, who's the Associate Dean and Professor of Strategic HR Management at Rutgers University School of Management and Labor Relations. He is the former direct executive director of the Center for Management Development and the director of the Center for HR Strategy. Um, again, I'll reiterate, this panel's pretty short, so we're gonna keep questions um, until the end, and we'll stop at about five minutes. Uh, thank you, Allison. Uh, pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Mackin, and what, how we've uh, imagined structuring this, we'll have a, a little bit of back and forth between Bill and I, but Bill's going Bill's gonna to kick it off and give some overview of what is happening in the field, just statistically what, the, what ESOPs are all about, uh, where they are, and uh, to kind of locate this issue for people. I'm going to talk more about the trends and about, about what this looks like from uh, the employee standpoint, the culture standpoint, and what's driving this going forward. And from that as a starting point, we'll be shifting over into the more technical discussion of how the plans are implemented with our next set of panels. So, Bill Castellano. Okay, let me get the clicker. You know, a professor always needs a clicker, right? Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And, um, to talk a little bit about um, this new center that we've actually created at um, Rutgers. Uh, we're partnering with the National Center for Employee Ownership. We also collaborate with the ESOP Association. And we established a New Jersey, New York um, Center for Employee Ownership. So Rutgers, we've been a leader in the research in employee ownership. We have um, Dr. Joseph Blasi and Doug Cruz, who has written many books and conducted um, a series of research looking at the benefits of employee ownership. So we thought this was a good um, place for us to establish this center. And the goal of the center is to raise awareness, to help people understand this research. You know, we partner with service providers to also provide some technical assistance for companies looking to establish um, employee ownership, ESOP type strategies. And we conduct a series of programs, you know, targeting um, the New Jersey and New York economy to help um, retain companies, to help retain um, employees and the like. Um, this is a growing field. Um, unfortunately, the, the data on all of these um, statistics are not up to date. Um, the most recent that I was able to find is 2014. Over s close to 7,000 ESOPs 
Um, it's a growing area. It's, it has gone up and down, particularly after the, um, the Great Recession. $1.3 trillion in total assets, 14 million participants, so that's about 10% of the um, U.S. labor market. So it's a significant um, portion. We see, um, looking at demographics, um, a growing trend. Um, you know, I think in Chris's presentation, he'll be talking a little bit more about what we think of um, the future of this business, but clearly the demographics are, are very, very positive. Um, when we look at the industry group, it's a pretty cross representation of industries that we find ESOPs. Um, it started predominantly in the manufacturing sector, but more recently um, the professional science technical services areas have um, seen the most recent growth, uh, particularly the startup tech firms, architectural firms, engineering firms, um, and that trend is significantly increasing. Right? The number of smaller firms, entrepreneurial type firms, that are um, increasingly growing in the economy uh, are prime targets for um, a strategy like an ESOP. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we see um, a lot of positive trends in this area. What we really are known for at Rutgers is looking at the, the association or the relationship between employee ownership ESOP type plans and firm performance. And overwhelmingly, um, the research is very, very positive. You know, no matter what statistic you look at, whether it's an increase in productivity, um, whether it's um, survivor rate, there was an interesting <coughs> study after the Great Recession looking at the survivor rate of different firms, and clearly ESOP owned firms um, outperformed comparable other firms, um, higher job growth. So there's a really strong relationship. And I think um, looking at the research that we've done at Rutgers, there's two drivers, right? There's clearly the extrinsic. Um, in, New, in New Jersey, the average participant in an ESOP has about 216,000 in assets. Um, in New York, it's about 185,000. So that's clearly um, a positive. Um, it's a significant part of their wealth. Um, so there is that intrinsic relationship. But more specifically, I think there's also an intrinsic relationship. Employees of employee-owned firms um, identify with their company. Um, their values are more aligned. So that's highly correlated to engagement, which we know also is significantly related to firms' ability to achieve strategic and financial outcomes. Um, so overwhelmingly, um, we, we see a lot of positive uh, relationships between the two. Um, Chris is going to talk more specifically about what's really happening in this market and looking at some of these other future trends. Sure. Chris? Thank you, Bill. Uh, so what's driving the, the trends here? Why is there more interest in ESOPs than ever before? Well, it has something to do with the color of my hair and a few other people in the room here. Uh, business owners, uh, primarily of closely held businesses, are reaching retirement age. Baby boomers, demographics are dominating the news, dominating trends, and lots of these business owners have got to make a decision about what to do with their life's work, with their businesses. And as more and more stories get, get told, I'm thinking right now the craft brewing industry, Harpoon Brewing up in Boston, New Belgium Brewing in, in Colorado and down in North Carolina, businesses that were founded by baby boomers that have sold recently internally. Um, there are more and more business owners who are, are looking at this and trying to decide what to do. Uh, the majority of, of wealth that people, baby boomers have is tied up in these firms. So they have a decision to make. And it is not an accident, and it's, it's, it's worth just a, a moment of, of context here, that the, the laws and regulations exist to make this an attractive option for people. There's, there's some people in the room who've been in this field for a long time, and they can tell, that they may have known Senator Russell Long and the legislators who had the idea to put this in the law in the first place. This is not an idea that just dropped from the sky. It was an intentional uh, uh, policy idea of Senator Long's, the son of Huey Long, the famous, famous populist. How Russell looked at the world a little bit differently than his father is that he didn't just want to redistribute the wealth through taxation. He decided we needed to figure out how to pre-distribute wealth through the ownership of companies, how to make it possible to create more capitalists 
What Russell used to say is that the only problem with capitalism is that there are too few capitalists. He was the head of the Senate Finance Committee, and he had the power and leverage to do something about that, created a set of tax incentives that make it attractive for business owners to sell internally. And that's why we have what we have today. I'm going to come back to that in a second. So a little, a little bit uh, more data here on the silver tsunami. So there's two, there's two uh, points here. One is the silver, and the second is the tsunami. Here is here are the age of U.S. business owners. 51% uh, of, of businesses of the, the ones that were studied here uh, on the right are owned by people 50 years, in, 50 years of age and up. And that's grow 33%, 35 to 49, and under 35 in blue. So you, that is clearly, there's a trend going on here. And if we look at the, the actual numbers, we're talking about 720,000 companies, privately held companies, that are going to be changing hands in the next number of years. And seminars like this, uh, the good work of the, our sponsors who've put this together, make it possible for business owners to look at this as an exit mechanism. But what does this look like from the vantage point of employees, the people whom Senator Long had primarily in mind when he wrote the legislation? Well, it's, it's what you might expect. Employees like this idea. 83% of employees responded that ownership is important to them. 84% recognize that the company's future performance will affect their financial security. 76% understand employee ownership and how it works at their company. 90% of employees care about meeting the customer's needs. 89% actively contribute to group problem solving efforts. And 96% are willing to do extra work to get the job done when the company needs it. Now this also reminds me of another study that was done. And it's important to emphasize this because when this is a seminar that's going to talk primarily about the financial and tax side of things. But from a cultural standpoint, the data is even stronger in companies that make investments in communication and education of their employees. Just dropping a favorable benefit plan, retirement plan, on your employees because you've had a conversation with your lawyer or your accountant isn't a sufficient act to get your employees interested in understanding what this opportunity is all about. Employees need to be communicated with. And over time, companies need to sort of wrestle on their own way. They have to think about how they want to bring employees in more and more into decision making, how to share more information. If you want your employees to think like owners and act like owners, well, they're going to want to know more about the company that they're being asked to be a partner in. And the, and the data is actually very strong on this, is that the companies that do more by way of communication and participation do better than companies that just treat this as a purely financial transaction. But there, there really are two, two things just to close out. So this, this is sort of the data, the magic culturally. But the magic sort of practically from a finance standpoint, and, and we can, uh, Allison's got some questions for us, and we'll hear from you, but where I want to leave things. Is that, is, that, is that what Senator Long did is that he overcame the most sort of common sense confusion that people have when you talk about employee ownership in our economy. Most people say, well, that sounds like a great idea, but how are employees going to be able to buy, buy companies? How do employees who are put, putting groceries on the table, how, are they, how is it possible for them to buy companies of real value? Well, that's where Senator Long's brilliance came in with the help of Louis Kelso in creating the form of a legal trust, a specific form of legal trust, that goes to the bank to borrow money on behalf of the employees to make these transactions happen. Employees aren't asked to come out of pocket to be able to make these, these transactions happen. They are participants in a trust with their management that with the permission and support of the seller, of the owner, they go to the bank to borrow the money. That's how the seemingly impossible is made possible. Uh, and, and our laws in the United States are the strongest ones in the world on this, on this score. Other countries, England has, has done some great things over the years, but no other country has this as, as favorable a tax regime, and in particular makes use of this, of this legal trust that can act on behalf of employees in corporate transactions, in going to the bank and borrowing the money. So that's just a little bit of background, and let's hear what Allison has to ask us. Yes, uh, so I have a few questions before I open it up to the audience. 
Um, the first, and either of you can answer these. So you were talking about the industry data. Right. Um, can you maybe explain, do ESOPs work better in some industries than others? Are there ones that this really doesn't work well in? Well, you would think capital intensive industries would not be um, prime candidates, but the data um, contradicts that. You know, manufacturing um, industry um, is well known um, for ESOPs. Um, as I was mentioning before, there is this growing trend among um, um, technical firms, architectural engineering firms, smaller growing entrepreneurial type firms. The median size company is about 150, um, but there's a large range. It goes from 50 to 300,000. Um, we're also, in some of the research that we've been doing, looking at the possibility of large, maybe even Fortune 500 companies spinning off subsidiaries. Um, as an ESOP type option. And we, we think there's a, um, a, a good market for that. And um, so that would be kind of a unique way for an organization to use an ESOP. Right. To just, just to add a little bit, uh, as, as Bill mentioned in his, his earlier remarks, I think the, the concentration of manufacturing is in part historical. Uh, that this, that's really how the ESOP movement got started. This is sort of the Main Street USA phenomenon. And the business owners who were paying attention at first were the owners of manufacturing firms, a lot, a lot of them in the Midwest. Minnesota has the highest density of ESOPs in the country. Ohio, I think, is right behind it. Uh, but over time, the, the word has spread through the professional community and, and into the technical community and engineering community. And now it's really pretty much across the board. Okay, so there isn't a single... No. no. Interestingly, there's new legislation in New York and New Jersey targeting um, agricultural um, family farms, you know, looking at that as an option for, for ESOPs as well. And as you mentioned legislation, I, I mentioned Senator Long, who's, who's, uh, who's gone on to his reward. Uh, but uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, here in New York has recently submitted a bill in support of employee ownership, right. uh, as has Senator Sanders. And, and, but it, it's also, this, this is a, an important point to emphasize as well. There's, there is strong bipartisan support for this idea. Republicans and conservative people tend to like this idea because they think it promotes self-reliance and less dependent on the government for welfare programs. Because the people making more money and saving more money and having stronger retirements are going to be less dependent on government. So a lot of Republican, conservative people look at it that way. Democrats tend to look at this as a, a fairer break, a better break for the average working person to be able to bring more democracy and fairness to the economy. And those of us in the field love both sets of reasons. Uh, there's no reason to have to identify with one party or another here. And uh, there are people in today's Congress who are paying attention to this on both sides of the aisle. And so my second question, um, you were talking about you know, how this can benefit employees. But are there certain company employees that benefit more than others? Um, I guess if you could explain, break that down. Well, us. not really. I mean, it, dep it depends. Uh, generally, the allocation formulas are you, you can't discriminate. In fact, if you're going to be putting in one of these plans in your company, you have to offer it to all, all employees. There's a potential carve out if you have a unionized workforce. You have to negotiate with the union about it, bring the topic up, and see if they want to be involved or not. You can, both parties can decide that that's not going to happen. But generally speaking, it's a non-discriminatory form of employee ownership. And, and that's how it's a little bit different from stock options and other kinds of executive pay. It really is inclusive. It has to involve everybody. Right. Okay. So there aren't any employees that potentially are worse off, or not worse off, but no. I mean, you generally, stock is 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 allocated according to W two. So you take the salary of, let's say, the CEO as the numerator, and the and the total payroll as the denominator. That gives you a sense that the people who've invested a little bit more in their in their training and, and careers and so forth are going to get more. But you can't exclude people at the lower end of the scale. Okay. Great. Um, and is there, you know, we're, I think we're nearing, I think we have about four minutes left. Okay. Um, were there any main points you wanted to say as takeaways before I open it up to the audience? Or? No, let's, let's, see, what the, let's right. see what they have to say. Okay. I think we had some microphones too, right? Okay. Um, all right. And you had a question? Oh, okay. Is that on? Yep. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned briefly that it's really important if you're going to set up NESOP to communicate the value to the employees right. so they know what right. they're getting or, you know, to get that bond going. What do you recommend as strategies to do that? Well, actually, the first thing I, I 
I highly recommend, and this, this sort of well, it came to me over time uh, in doing this work, is that you, there, a, a really good job needs to be done of communicating the seller's story. Um, I recently did a, a short film with the founder of Web Industries, which is a, a very successful ESOP company that's headquartered in Massachusetts. They're in Georgia and Texas and, uh, and Indiana, various places. And uh, no one had ever, ever interviewed Bob Fulton as to why he did this in the first place. And I, I see, I, th I think the first question on employees' minds when they're being told that they're going to be included in this new benefit plan that involves employer stock is, how is this possible? And, and why is it being done? So that simple, simple, those simple questions need to be answered. They need to be captured, ideally, you know, in face-to-face -face meetings initially when you roll this out, but I mean, there are going to be new employees coming in. That story needs to be captured in a, in a five-minute or a ten-minute film uh, where the founders tell their story. So that's, that's the first objective. The second objective after that are content objectives, basically about, about what I distinguish between facts, skills, and values. So you want to explain what the facts are, how the, how the plan works. You want to help foster skills, analytical financial skills about, about what being an owner is, understanding numbers, and values. You want to be able to sort of teach and talk about taking greater responsibility, what entrepreneurship and ownership means. You want to sort of uncork that and have good, rich conversations about the meaning of ownership. And then finally, the third perpetual challenge is figuring out how to, how to draw people in with their ideas. Their owners, they're going to come up with ideas about how to do things better. And there need to be mechanisms to solicit that stuff, structures to be able to process those ideas and to implement them, to give people a chance to not just think like owners, but also act. I think broadly it's um, you know, known to employee involvement, having employees involved in decision making, and you know, complementing that would be open transparency, you know, having um, uh, employees know the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, what's going on with the business, and, and getting their input um, and involvement in decision making processes that, that impact the business, um, you know, all help both the employees and the, the organization succeed. Other questions? Right. Microphone? Oh, yeah. Do we have the microphone? Sorry, Where's the microphone? Here. Which one do you want to go? Oh, to? right, right here in the front. Sorry. Blue shirt. Blue shirt. Yes. Oh. Better with my indicators. Oh, there's two blue shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, well, the first question I had was in the earlier slides you had, uh, I was surprised by how low the percentage of ownership was with IT and uh, right. um, tech mm -hmm. companies. I would have thought it would be the other way around. And I assume that has something to do with the fact that not every stock ownership program is an ESOP, uh, and maybe right. that data. So I was just curious about that. But the more interesting uh, oh. question I was going to ask you was, uh, the ability, what ability is there to customize an ESOP? Uh, and in particular, I'm thinking, you know, employees of Bear and Lehman Brothers uh, had a high percentage ownership of their net worth in their company, and that didn't work out so well for them. And I'm wondering to what extent it's possible to include maybe puts or collars in an ESOP to try to shape the, you know, the downside risk and still keep the advantage of, you know, being an owner and being motivated. And the, and a related question is, uh, you're beginning to address this. You're beginning to address that is the ability of to try to get more contribution that's non-work, but so almost like board level contribution to get people to say, you know, there may be a better way to run the business. Because right. often there's a there's a big disconnect between those two at a lot of public companies. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you right. might have to give us kind of your one minute take on this because I think we're well. There are there are different um, forms of of stock ownership, of broad-based stock ownership, you've got another call. <laughs> uh, so, so the, the uh, and what we're talking about here today is, I mean, we, Bill and I have, have referred to this as three lily pads of, of employee ownership because there are sort of, it, there's, there are stock options and executive pay, that's, that's lily pad number one. Lily pad number two is broad-based ownership through ESOPs, which is a very specific 
form of ownership through a retirement plan, much like a 401k plan. That hasn't been said yet. So as a frame of reference, this is like a 401k plan that deliberately invests in employer stock. It's focused on employer stock. That's what it, it's supposed to do. And then there's a sort of a third group of cooperatives, employee ownership trusts, more smaller companies where people start up businesses that way. And in some ways, some of the venture stuff is related to that. Um, it, there, there are some limits in terms of, of the design features of ESOPs because Congress wanted to make sure that this wasn't a mechanism just to reward the top 20% of the company. This was supposed to democratize capitalism. This is supposed to bring more people in. Uh, so if, if, as is the case sometimes with early stage companies, with more venture companies that, that don't necessarily want to spread ownership that way, an ESOP may not be the best mechanism. Uh, but for companies that have achieved, have plateaued, and are, are, are growing slowly and want to hold on to their people, and want to build a culture of ownership, and ESOP can be the strongest mechanism. All right, I think that has to be the, the end. Um, but thank you so much. All right, great, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, if I can get uh, John and Russell to take the stage, please. <clears throat> And I'll go ahead and get started. So this is our second panel, Wealth Creation, Succession Planning, Plan Design, and Case Study Discussion. Um, you are welcome to ask questions throughout this, this panel. So if something, they say something and it interests you, go ahead and uh, speak up. And our speakers today, immediately to my right, we have Russell Secor. He is the founder, chief executive officer, and chief financial officer of Clean Air Quality Service Incorporated a provider of heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration services to New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, in 2015, Mr. Secor and his partner sold 100% of the company to an employee ownership stock, or employee stock ownership plan. And then we also have uh, John Vitucci. He is a principal in the employee benefits services practice at PKF O'Connor Davies, and has more than 30 years of experience working with Fortune 500 corporations and investment banks in all areas of employee benefits, executive compensation, and ERISA. And so I'll let you two kind of take it away and sure. probably have some questions in, in between. Okay. Well, I'll kind of start it off here. Um, the, the first thing with a biz, a private, any private business is the risk in that business. And most business owners have 80% of their wealth in the business. And there's a lot of issues around, you know, what those risks, whether it be economic, whether it be technology, whether it be talent, all of these different factors are, create a lot of risk for, for a private business. And if you look at the S&P 500, if you go back 25 years, there's a turnover of about 50% just in the S&P 500. And it's even greater in, in private businesses. So it, it, it's, a, it's clearly a challenge. And when you look at the statistics, it, it's actually mind-boggling that uh, in, pri in private companies, there's only probably like of, of 1.3 trillion in company stock that are in ESOPs, only 300 billion is in private company ESOPs. And when you look at it as a percentage of the market, it's fascinating that it's like less than 1% of the market are in ESOPs, and when I look at the companies and the tax benefits and all the things that you can do, it, I think it should be more closer to 40, 50 percent. And, and the first question people will say is why, why is there such a disconnect in, in the market? And I think there's a couple of factors. I think one of the biggest factors is a lack of knowledge. I think the trusted service providers, the accountants, the lawyers, the investment bankers, the financial advisors, don't really have a lot of knowledge in, in this space. And then when you talk to them, they say, oh, we always talk about it as alternative, but we don't, we don't go there. So what I'd like to do is talk about today about the, that value proposition and, and, and just talk about live cases that, are, that we're working on. So the, the next question is, why is it the private business owner 
a lot of them don't even sell the business. Then they get sick, they, uh, they become disabled, they don't have a succession team, they don't believe they're going to die. They, they, there's a l number of factors that, that creates the paralysis. So it, I find it, like I said, it's, it's an incredible anomaly. But the anomaly existed in the Fortune 500 in the early 90s. And I had the exact same anomaly. When I, I started my career, I started at the IRS, and then I was fortunate enough to go to work for a big four firm where I worked for over 24 years. And one of the good things about working in a big four firm in New York, and especially in the 1980s, everything came into New York. So I'd get calls from Omaha, where there's a client called Berkshire Hathaway, they'd have a question. I'd get a call from all the automakers in Detroit, they'd have a question. And, and the beauty about that is you get to look above the trees. And even today with analytics, you, have, you can have all the data in the world, but if you're not analyzing it properly, it's, it's a mess. So 401k plans started, in, we all know 401ks kind of started in the 80s. And then what happened in the 90s is there was an explosion of company stock in 401k plans. And you had companies matching in company stock, and you had employees uh, investing. And, and what happened quite often was the reason the employees were going so much in company stock is because mutual funds were just really starting and no one really know, knew much about them. So what I found was that almost every Fortune 500 really had an ESOP, not a 401k plan. So I spent basically the whole 90s on a plane setting up ES converting the plans to ESOPs taking advantage of all kinds of tax benefits that Congress had offered ESOPs, and we were creating two, three hundred million dollar tax benefits to companies like General Motors, all the Baby Bells, all of uh, the tele, uh, not the, the, the public utilities, I think I worked on 40 public utilities set because they were very big on company stock. And what happened is with these design changes, we were creating hundreds of millions of dollars of value for the workers, okay? And uh, I was going to go ahead and interject since you mentioned tax benefits. Um, can you maybe explain what those tax benefits are for everyone? Sure. Well, in public companies, there are different rules, which we're going to focus on private companies. So I'm going to focus on the opportunity here in private. So public companies have different rules on tax. On tax. But we're going to talk. I'm going to, I, I can't spend, I could spend a day just on the corporate side. But on the private side, um, the big opportunity is if you have a company that's owned by 100% by an ESOP, and you have an S corporation, the business doesn't pay any taxes. So think about how powerful that is from a federal point of view in a state. Most states recognize that, that provision. So, that, so if you have a company that's earning $20 million a year, okay, and the company is worth $100 million, it's a private business, one business owner, so I'll go talk to the business owner, and I'll say to him or her, I'll say, listen, I go, you've got 100 million locked up in this business. You don't have much personal assets. How would you like a strategy that develops a succession plan for you? Okay, it allows you to continue working and running the business. It allows you to double your wealth and it, it'll make your employees millionaires. And nine times out of 10, we'll move forward with the opportunity. The two scenarios I don't go forward in a situation like that is one is there's dysfunction of the ownership group. They hate each other, so they won't do anything that helps anybody else. Or there's too much wealth creation for, for the employees. So let me go back to my $20 million EBITDA company. So right now, that company may be right here in New York City. They're earning $20 million a year. That business owner, it's a pass-through entity. They may already be an S-Corp. Most of them are pass-through entities. They're, paying, they're at a 50% plus tax rate, right? Right now, they're paying $10 million a year in taxes on that $20 million earnings, disregarding, say, salary for that business owner. So $10 million a year is now going to the government. If that business owner sells 100% of the company to an ESOP, the business becomes tax-free, right? So the business earning $20 million a year is no longer paying taxes. And what I like to do, and I'm going to leave bank financing on the side. You could always interject it. I'm just going to use seller, using seller notes. If I do a 10-year seller note, that $10 million a year that I was gonna, that's going to the government can now help me monetize my business over the next 10 years. But remember, I'm earning $20 million a year, so I could prepay that note maybe within five to seven 
years. So what I've done is I've created a succession plan. I've, 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 I've created diversification from the business owner, okay? The, the other thing I've done is I can design the plan to put the owner inside the ESOP or his family inside the ESOP, say between 20 and 49% of the ESOP. So now what happens in, in, in 10 years after the seller note gets paid off, and, and Michael McKinley is going to talk about valuation later, what happens with a $100 million company uh, today, if it's earning $20 million a year, what we find is if the company doesn't grow, in 10 years it's worth $200 million. If the company grows 5%, that company could be as high as three or four hundred million. So what we've done is we've designed a structure that, that monetizes the owner today, gets them out, not out, but they still, engage, and when they're real, if this, the person's 50 years old and they really want to retire at age 60, we've created an exit strategy that gets them another payout that could potentially be higher than the original payout when they monetize the company to begin with. So it's incredibly powerful. And, and you'd say to yourself, why would a business owner do anything else? If you compare it to, say, selling a private equity, if, if you sell the private equity, pri private equity is going to only pay fair market value, right? Well, same thing is getting going on here. You're going to get fair market value to the business. You're not going to get a second payout the way you're going to get a second payout with, with an ESOP, right? So it's, it's a period of private, unless private equity comes in and says we're going to give you a 15 multiple, then you take the money and you run, okay? And it's happened, it does happen, but that's the minority of the cases. It might be a real strategic reason to do that. But when you look at the other alternatives, so I was at an engineering firm yesterday, and the conversation was, well, I really have three choices. I could sell to a large engineering company or a public company, I could sell to my employees, have no money to buy the company, or some key employees, or I can do the ESOP and double my wealth and, and, and allow the employees to have a real, a real, create real value. So if the company in my example was worth, becomes worth 400 million in 10 years, and I have 100 employees, and, and the owner gets half of it, just to be, it might be less than that, what have I done? I've created every, every employee on average is getting $2 million in my example. And you could change the numbers, but the numbers are basically the same. Yes? How do the employees actually get value that's not on paper? Right? I mean, how do they access it? Okay. How do you get that second payout from the manager? Well, what happens is, um, depending on your pay, what, what happens originally is, what I do is I usually design my ESOP inside, of, because I've done so many Fortune 500 ESOPs inside 401k plans, I design it inside a, uh, uh, a 401k plan, and I use a very small amount of capital from employer money in, in the 401k. The, but to answer your question, the way the employees get paid out is either cash flow of the business or borrowing. So just to give, an, or the business gets sold. So like Bloomberg b and is a perfect example. Uh, BNA, I don't know if people are familiar, BNA, well, that's who's hosting our event today uh, from Bloomberg. Uh, a few years ago, they set up an ESOP. They had 750 employees in the ESOP. They uh, decided to sell to Bloomberg. Bloomberg bought the company for a billion dollars. Okay? Um, they had a full 401k with a match. They had a full defined benefit plan. And they got monetized by selling to a third party. Um, I don't know if many of you know, UP, everybody knows UPS, right? UPS is one of the other great stories uh, in the ESOP area. It used to be a client of my firm uh, based out of Atlanta. And UPS in the 80s realized that they had an incredible business model. And what UPS decided to do is they had a choice of, of when people leave, it's what's called a repurchase. So you either have to come out of the cash flow of the business or borrow to pay them or go public. What UPS decided to do was go public. So when they went public, you had the drivers getting average checks of between three and five million dollars each. That's why back, if you go to any golf course in the country, there's always one UPS member in the golf course. And they all own McDonald's franchises around the country. So a lot of them use that money to buy McDonald's franchises. So there's a pattern there. Anyway, long answer, yes. Right, and I have a question too. I mean, we're talking a lot about the benefits. Um, are there any downsides or maybe risks? And how would, if so, how do you kind of mitigate 
sure. any of that? Well, one of the things that I try to do is when we profile a company, we don't want, we don't want a bad company or a company that's failing. So I got called by a book publisher a couple of months ago, and they said, we've been losing money for three years, but we want to do an ESOP. And I said, listen, give me a call when you're profitable and you have a trend of profitability because you don't want to do the worst companies. We're not, ESOPs aren't an op, you know. What's fascinating between inv investment banking, investment bankers will think about ESOPs if they can't find another option. So what I think is if the company's not profitable, that's a danger, okay? And if the company has too much in one client, say for example, like your business model is based on, let's just say Verizon is your biggest client, 80% of your business, it's a little scary to do an ESOP or to overprice the ESOP. Or you're in a volatile industry, you build in. So that's why I personally like seller notes for these kind of transactions, because you could always renegotiate a seller note and if the earthquake hits, you can stretch it out. Um, you also, I like a longer horizon on the payout because then I could always prepay if we beat, beat projections. But bad company in, bad company, you're always gonna have a bad company. And then you always have it on, look, any business, we all, every business can have a change in its business model, right? Even the accounting, accounting, I'm in the accounting profession, our model has constantly changed over the last 30, 40 years. Like, like you wouldn't believe. The different regulations, different risks, different audit risks, tax risk. So any business can have those issues. Any other questions? Okay. So again, uh, we, we've done a lot of transactions where there is bank financing, but it, it, it's prudent bank financing. Where, where it doesn't make sense to do bank financing, the seller note is, is uh, a common denominator. What we find a lot of folks doing is what's called a 1042 transaction, whereby you sell the, there's, there's a special rule that if you have a, a corporation and you sell to an ESOP and the ESOP owns more than 30% of the business, the seller can defer the gain on the sale, okay? Um, which is a good strategy. The, the challenge I have with that strategy is you lever most people that do this kind of strategy, they're leveraging up the business to do the transaction then they're doing margin or some kind of leverage to buy the property to defer the gain, because part of deferring the gain is you've got to buy something else. So you have the financial advisor to put them in the equity markets on margin. So I look at that as a triple risk. You've got risk on the business, you've got risk on, on the investment, and now you've got a, a margin risk, which you, you know, we know margin can get dangerous sometimes. What I like about the seller note kind of bank financing, prudent bank financing, is that uh, it, it, it's more manageable. It, you could do a longer term financing and always, it's always easy to prepay, right? Like prepaying your mortgage. The, the other thing about it is that I like when the business owner is on both sides. You know, people talk about conflicts of interest. This is a good conflict of interest. I like when a business owner is on both sides of a business, both, both sides of a transaction because they want to get paid their seller note, and then they want to get their payout out of the ESOP. By them making sure this business is operating properly, they're going to make sure that, that all the participants are going to get paid out on the second side, on the second stage, because they want to get paid out. So what that does is it creates the real wealth, and it doesn't you know, create the uh, you know, frogs in the frying pan scenario with, with a bad company. So you, the business, and the business owner, most businesses, the reality is the founder, the owner, and Russell's gonna talk about his business and, and, and you know, he'll, he'll talk about his situation, but they're really, the, a lot of times they're the business. And if that person is exiting because they're getting a chunk of money, somebody's gotta run that business. So you need a, you, you know, there's a lot of factors in a business. One is they've gotta have a good business model. You got to have the right financial structure. You got to have the right talent, and you got to have the right people running the company, right? Otherwise, what do you have? You don't have a business if if, if one of those four things are are deficient. So the other thing that's nice about an ESOP is that if you do a lot with seller notes, the participants aren't really taking much risk at all. There's a very nominal amount of risk that they're taking. So it's like somebody comes to you and says, you're going to buy a million dollar house, but by the way, you only have to put 25,000 down or nothing down, and we're going to pay off your mortgage, and in 10 years, you're going to have a, 
million dollar house plus capital appreciation. That's an ESOP. Okay, that's how it, but by the way, Congress is going to fund that purchase because of all the tax benefits. You know, the businesses are going to pay tax. So you have, so imagine a 25% margin business not paying taxes. You're doubling your ROI. And what happens is these business, the biggest challenge with an ESOP company is your success. Okay? That, to me, that's the biggest challenge with an ESOP company. Not that it's going to go upside down. The biggest challenge is if you've profiled it the right way in the beginning, you've got the right business, you've got the right structure. I always look for a business that's earning money. You have to have enough employees to make it work. So I always look for a $2 million earnings business, at least. Maybe you could go low to a million. It, but I find that the bigger the business, the better, the easier it is to, to make the ESOP work. And you want more employees than less. The other thing about the ESOP is you could still do a full 401k. You could add a pension. I, I think the best strategy for an ESOP company is to add a defined benefit plan. Can anybody tell me why a defined benefit plan would make sense for an ESOP company? Yes? That's, that's correct. But let's say I have a comp my company is $100 million. I've had the ESOP in place for 10 years. I have 100 employees. I set up a defined benefit plan that everybody gets a $1 million in benefits out of the defined benefit plan. So it'll lower the value of the company, but big deal, right? Because it, you have, it's basically we've created a, a put option, a protection, a fail-safe mechanism. And if the company goes upside down, PBGC insures the company. Right? It's not a bad thing, right? Not the worst thing in the world. So I'm starting to work on mature ESOP companies putting defined benefit plans in place. So think about this. Now you've transferred, you've gotten the owner to make an incredible amount of wealth. The employees are, are, are doing extremely well. And now you've put in a structure that brings back defined benefit plans because it makes sense both economically and from a business point of view. Okay, and, and it's, I think ESOPs are the solution to the retirement crisis. Because a lot of the plans that I've seen, it, and, and you know, Russell can talk about his situation, but they're never going to get the value out of a 401k. It's not even, it's not even close. The, the value proposition isn't, isn't even close. So um, the other thing that's nice about the ESOP is, let's say the seller notes are paid off, and that company is now making $30 million a year. What I like to do, you start moving the cash into the ESOP 401k. In a private business, what happens with a private business? They constantly take the money out of the business, right? Because they're afraid of bankruptcy. So same thing with an ESOP company. You either use that money to, to pay employees for retirement, so you want to keep a reserve. And to the extent you can, start moving the cash into the ESOP. So now you could start maybe keeping 10, minutes, 10 million and start moving. To, after the note is paid off, there's no debt on the business. You either expand, do an a pre-tax acquisition. Who's got a better advantage of buying a business than a business that doesn't pay tax, right? The banks love the ESOPs because you've doubled your ROI. So why would it, if they were going to lend before, why wouldn't they lend with an ESOP? So, so what I try to suggest is you start moving cash into the ESOP. And you start, to, so you have a full 401k, you have a pension, and you start moving cash. Very powerful. Just imagine if each of us were in a structure like that. How We'd be all, I, um, I guarantee you, most of us in the room would be much better off than our current state. Okay? Yes? If you sell the company? A global? We've had, I, I've done a lot of work with global companies. Uh, Procter & Gamble used to be a client. They were a big ESOP. And what we did with, uh, with Procter is they had a different equity program in every country. So you, I mean, it's a, it was driven by the U.S., but each country has its, you know, and you really have to go to the host country, you know, what are their social securities, what are their tax, what is their, their accounting. But if you have a global, let's say you're 50-50, let's say 50% 50 is overseas and 50% is here, you could do the ESOP, have the U.S. employees own 100% of the company, and then you could do stock options or restricted stock for your foreign employees. 
The other thing that a lot of people don't know is if you have a global company and you've got a billion dollars trapped overseas, if you become an ESOP company, you can bring that home without, with no tax, okay? Because you're not paying tax in the U.S. for federal estate. So you have the inversions that already are in place, which is fast. I had a commodity trading firm that I've been talking to on a regular basis until they just ran a big loss. They had 300 million trapped overseas. And they may bring it now, but, but they're seriously thinking about it. And ESOP, because if they bring, they do the ESOP, they bring that $300 million home, uh, 300 million home. Yes? What is the conjecture about what the Trump administration will do with the tax program for ESOPs? Um, I'm working on about 15 ESOPs right now, and not one client has raised a concern. But if, even if rates go down to 15%, you're still better off with zero tax, okay? There's no talk of capital gains tax going down right now. And then you still have the states like New Jersey taxes the heck out of, you know, they don't have a difference between capital gains and ordinary income. So New York, New Jersey, you're still in a 30%, even, you'd still be in a 25% tax rate. And like I said, when you do the model, you're always better off with no tax than with tax, okay? So e even if the Trump, all the Trump provisions go into play, I, we haven't seen a down. As a matter of fact, we're doing more business this year than we, and most people I'm talking to are seeing more activity. And I think part of it, too, to be fair, is the, ba you know, the baby boomers. They're all going, they, there really aren't that many alternatives to the middle market. Com you know, the companies between 10 and 100 million. Is, you look at the alternatives, it's terrible. Like the engineering firm I had in yesterday, they have a book value program. What we're doing with the ESOP is almost like a private company IPL. So it, it, it adds a lot of value. Any well, other? When you talk about cap gains, um, I mean, isn't there a proposal right now to get rid of the 3.6% uh, that kind of goes into that capital gains? Well, you, when you sell your own business, the 3.8% Obama tax doesn't apply. That's okay. okay. Good question, bud. Yes. And that is the biggest issue. Um, most companies do, they, you know, you have to do what's called a repurchase study. And it's usually recommended every year or every other year. You do an analysis of, you know, who you think is going to retire. And, you, you know, we, we kind of do those studies. And you look at, and then there are rules on how you can defer. It's not like you have a lump sum when people leave. So you can pay uh, people with above a million eighty over, say, five years and then add a year for each amount that's over 210000 So a lot of my ESOPs, I do a five-year payout. Um, I try to pay uh, terminate employees right away only because their value is, because the value explodes. Like I, I just did an ESOP, uh, and Russell could talk about his ROI, but I just did an ESOP and the, the ROI is like 600 to 1. So there's a lot, I mean, the growth is like insane. You, you, I don't know of an ESOP where they're just so outperforming the S&P 500, it's sick. But it's basically cash flow, borrowing, go public. Uh, it, when we, when in a lot of the situations I set up, we buy key man insurance so that it pays off the owners, so the seller notes get paid off. So there are a lot of strategies, and it's, it, there's not one silver bullet. I, I, I've got a company that I've just worked on with, with Michael, with Kinley, who's going to talk in a little while. They're going to generate like a, I don't know, a billion dollars of cash over the next 10 years. So we're talk. So they were. They they said to us, you know, we want to keep this as an ESOP because this is like too good to be true. So what we're doing is we're going to help them put a pension plan together to to reduce the value and do a value shift. And the, there's a there's an arbitrage in the accounting rules for accounting and tax. So you can get a big play on reducing the value and do a shift with a pension plan, and that helps you manage the repurchase liability. Um, so I do hate to interrupt you. I think we, uh, I think we have about sure. Ten. And and we're going to shift to. There are special rules. We got okay. thirty seconds, so I can cover these slides in thirty seconds because we've covered <laughs> most of it anyway. Um, there are anti-abuse rules. So this is the nuclear bomb for ESOPs. You, you, the owners can't go above a certain level, or or what they call disqualified persons. So in aggregate, a disqualified person is a ten percent or more owner. 
and I'm really simplifying the rule, but 10% of owners can't own more than 49% of the business, and there's special rules for family. So you, you lose your tax benefits and excise tax. It's a nuclear bomb. We don't go there. Okay. The repurchase liabilities we talked about, um, we, we can touch this. Uh, I, I'd rather, we could leave this up right now, and then uh, our next session is going to cover some of the players that are involved. We're going to have a bunch of players on, on our panel. But I want to give Russell his fair, fair time uh, to answer and to discuss the situation. Sure, and I'll go ahead and kick off um, that portion of this panel uh, just by asking Russell some questions. So, you know, why did your company decide to go with an ESOP? Um, were there any challenges that you faced? Maybe your main piece of advice for the audience? Um, sounds too good to be true. No taxes. That's crazy, right? So, for us, uh, you know, I've been in the mechanical industry my entire life. Um, I'm a third generation sheet metal worker, a second generation mechanical contractor, and a first generation uh, mechanical services provider. Um, I basically built my service company out of the basement of my house on the backbone of my father's mechanical business, who he was partners with three other people. So I watched that company uh, for the lack of a better term, turn and burn because his partners and him didn't get along and they never put the, the stepping stones of perpetuation in place. So the business could carry on, no middle management, no plan. They were a very big company. Uh, we did work all over the place, hospitals, uh, buildings in Manhattan, all sorts of things. Um, but basically, it dissolved and passed away, no value. So I said to myself, well, I don't know that I'm going to do that, right? So I turned around and did some reading and saw that there was this pay no taxes scenario, spoke to John, and we created this, this way of uh, passing along my business to the next generation. And it could survive and people would flourish and it would carry on. Um, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a good thing for a lot of businesses. I don't know that it fits all businesses, but my situation uh, definitely works. And, and Russell and his partners all participate in the ESOP. So they, we, we originally did a seller note, and then uh, they, you went to a bank afterwards and, and, and fin yeah. refinanced some of it. So basically, we had a tax liability of an average about $800,000 a year. So we now take that tax liability and we use that as the mechanism to uh, fund uh, purchases when people are going to leave and also to pay the seller notes. The bank was very free to come in and do the seller notes over a 10-year term and it, it, it works out quite well. Well, and is there anything you wish maybe you had known before um, you know, going with the ESOP? Uh, maybe I would have liked to do it a little earlier, you know. Um, you know, uh, I'm pretty young. I'm 55. I'm a baby boomer, I guess. Um, I'm not looking to retire, but I'm looking to retire from a company that's flourishing and that I might be able to turn around and say, hey, uh, you know, I'll st stay working for as long as I can to stay in the business. I enjoy the business. So right. it works well. And, and there was not a lot of pressure on Russell to get, you know, the beauty about what Russell did was there wasn't a, a lot of pressure to get the last dollar on the sale to the ESOP. Like a lot of companies, when they exit, when the owners exit, they want the very last dollar. And that wasn't, you know, Russell went to great lengths to, you know, not get, I don't know if you want to talk about that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so when I started at a basement in my house, uh, I realized that uh, when my father's business was terminating, my business basically was starting to flourish. Um, I knew that I couldn't go it alone. So this was in the 90s. So as time went on, I would pick up a partner here, a partner there. Before you know it, I had three partners. Um, having the lion's share of the stock, I basically was the bus driver. And I, I put the business to where it needed to be. But you can't do it alone. Uh, so when we, one of my partners is a little older than me. Uh, he always talks about retirement early. 
So I decided that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and work and, you know, pay him out for a value of a, of a piece of a business. I turned around and said, I think that this is the way we're going to do it. Um, we all considered it and it turned out that it turns out quite well because he's paid out early before he even has to leave the business. And, and one of the things that I was kind of proud of, and I don't know if you want to talk about it, we had one employee that was autistic. And you remember that day we went for lunch and you were saying, John, yeah. what are the other employees going to say that this person is going to get so much value? So, yeah, one of, <laughs> one of the other reasons, you know, <laughs> understanding my situation, we had turned around and developed a 401k probably about 15 years ago because there's a, a, a certain group of people a dozen or so people that aren't affiliated with any of the unions. Um, I have total of probably about 75 or 80 people that work for me. Uh, gross sales are somewhere between 20 and 25 million every year. Um, everybody else is unionized. So this 401k was developed just for the people that weren't in a union and I, I couldn't pay them a union scale. I couldn't look to overpay uh, my sister who works there or my wife who works there, or this autistic person uh, who works there for you know the last 20 years that I promised his mother I'd give him a job forever, but I only pay him $11 an hour. So what could I do for these people? I decided to do this 401k, and now the 401k was the vehicle that made the ESOP happen. So all these people are the members of the ESOP. Not any of the unionized workers, just the uh, dozen or so people that are basically mostly management some low-level people that come in to, uh, at like a ground level, yard helper, or so forth and so on. And All right, and I think uh, we have about three, a little over three minutes, uh, so if there are any other questions, or I could ask more. All right, from the back. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, well, for one, they're overpaid. Uh, <laughs> the second one was they're, they're, they're already, uh, they already are involved in a pension plan, correct? So, so, so this pension plan was developed for all the non-union workers, which was basically the managerial staff. So the people that are, I'll call the heart of the business, weren't being compensated like the people who were out there doing the work. So I developed the 401k to treat them as fair as I could. And then obviously the ESOP even you know, doubles down on that. So in the first year we did the ESOP, we had a two month period, a uh, gap period. We closed, I think it was October. We closed in October of 2015. Uh, the stock ended up being worth $75 a share. Uh, we just had the stock evaluated for 2016 it's worth uh, five hundred and nine dollars a share. So I think we outperformed the S and P five hundred in one year. Pretty good. It's not a Google, but it's it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the power of of tact, the compounding, and and you, you know paying off debt. So so when I talk to clients about an ESOP, I tell them the only difference between an ESOP and private equity, and really this is the truth. An ESOP. Uh, private equity buys a business and uses the cash flow to pay off the debt, right? And ESOP does the same thing, except you're not paying taxes to the government and you're not giving 40% of the profits to a third party. That's the difference between an ESOP and a private equity deal. In my, in my noble or humble, not noble, humble, humble opinion. You know, another, uh, another view is, you know, from a business owner perspective, is that sooner or later I, I, I want to get rid of that personal liability. So I have personal liability to union pension plans. I have personal liability to uh, the bonding company. You know, by doing the ESOP, all that goes away. So now I can stay working and you know not have that monster on my back worrying about you know if something did happen. So now I actually I, I find myself more productive now than I did before. And of the 10 ESOPs we've worked on in the last 10 years, there's probably half of them had union pension light. And it really is the only way, you know, you, you think about how do you, how do you, call, call, you know, put a box out that union liability. This is really one way to do it because you're getting monetized for the value of the business. 
And if the union plan doesn't blow up, you'll get paid, you'll get paid again. But if it does blow up, which we expect to happen over the next 10, 20 years, you, at least you've gotten your value, your value added to business. All right. Well, I think on that note, I think we're pretty much out of time. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. If we could get um, the closing panel com come up to the stage. Thank you. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so for this panel, our panelists have asked for maybe audience questions at the end, but I think we're going to stop earlier, about 10 minutes before the end of it. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers today. So we have um, Stephen Etkind. He's a partner at Satis and Globe Goldberg, sorry, LLP, where he oversees the firm's tax, trusts, estates, uh, RISA, and employee stock ownership groups. Mr. Etkind has represented trust companies or business owners in numerous ESOP transactions, advised many businesses and private investment partnerships on taxation, corporate transactions, business succession issues, and employee incentive strategies. And then next to him, we have Kirsty Corey. She's a senior vice president at Great, Great Bank Trust Company. Prior to joining Great Bank Trust, Ms. Corey opened the Illinois Office of Bankers Trust Company Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Uh, services. She has worked with employee-owned companies since the 1990s, providing trustee and ESOP transactional services to clients throughout the country. And then at the very end, we have Michael McG McKinley, or McKinley, sorry, who operates out of and manages Prairie Capital Advisors Atlanta office. He specializes in all aspects of ownership transaction or transition financial advisory services to business owners, board of directors, and trustees including employee stock ownership plans um, among you know, mergers and acquisitions and some other things. So I'll go ahead and let you all take the lead. Okay. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, so uh, first of all, I, I just wanted to say if, if anybody who's been sitting through all of this wants to stand up, it won't be disruptive to me. I, mm -hmm. I know it's hard to sit for hours on end and be, we've given a lot of information to you. And as you can see, we've got a presentation here called Valuation and Financing Approaches, Legal Issues, and Preparing for Sale. Uh, so that's a lot of ground to cover in 40 minutes uh, with 10 minutes of questions. Uh, so anyway, like I said, I, so I got a standing desk uh, a couple years ago, and I found that sitting for too long um, is, is difficult. And so like I said, you're not going to disrupt me if you want to stand up. Uh, get the blood flowing. I think that's helpful. And so first, again, I wanted to thank the people at Bloomberg B&A for hosting this event. It's a really nice space and a beautiful day here in New York. And I, I really appreciate everybody being able to make it here today. Uh, this is, uh, I was really impressed with the crowd. And I've, uh, you know, we, we never thought that we would have uh, standing room only for some of you folks. And, uh, so you know, we were having debates about whether we were going to have enough room, you know, or what were we going to do with all the extra chairs. So I was going to say, if anybody wants to sit in mind for now, please take it. Uh, so um, what we're going to do is, in addition to talking about all of these issues, um, we also wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, and just a little bit of foundation on ESOPs. And, and the reason for that is some of you are professionals who are working with clients that are thinking about uh, using an ESOP as an ownership transition tool. Some of you are business owners and you're thinking about uh, putting in an ESOP at your company. And some of you are journalists and you're looking at ways to cover ESOPs in the, um, in the business world. And so we want to talk a little bit about what ESOPs are, how they work, how they're put in, things like that. Uh, so that as you're talking to your clients or you're communicating this to the public or you're uh, thinking about this for yourself, you can think about the many buckets uh, that we use in approaching ESOPs. And we're going to get some advice from our panel here. 
from a legal and trustee perspective uh, as, as we go through this. But ESOPs fill uh, several buckets. They're, they're, um, they're not just an ownership transition uh, tool. So it is a trust. It is a way for you to sell the stock in your company and transition your ownership. It's a liquidity strategy for that owner. Uh, it's a tax efficient uh, way of transitioning ownership. So there are tax advantages both to you as a seller uh, as well as to a company going forward. And, and so we talked a little bit about tax advantages uh, with, you mentioned there it's the 1042 option as, as one uh, to a seller, but really the powerful one being to the company on the, on the back end if you're 100 percent percent ESOP owned as an S corporation, and you're not paying federal or state income taxes going forward, how powerful that can be. But it's also a retirement plan. So it's a regulated uh, by ERISA. Uh, it's something you have to think of not only selling your business, but creating a retirement plan for your employees. And what benefit levels do you want to deliver? And, and so uh, it's, it's not just a sale but you're creating an ownership structure and a benefit structure for people going forward. And so you have to be very thoughtful, not just about how do we get through the sale, but what does the company look like 10, 20, 30 years out. And so it adds a little bit of complexity to that. One of the things we wanted to talk about is also, if, as you're thinking about what makes a good ESOP candidate. And so I, I thought I'd um, ask, both of you, you know, in your experience, what do you think makes a good candidate for an ESOP-owned company? I think um, it was John that kind of touched on this earlier, um, that a profitable company with usually over a million dollars in um, profit each year with a, um, at least 15 employees or so. Um, so you want to have a good, good participant base, uh, profitable company, one that you can see succeeding into the future. I would say, Michael, <clears throat> from the owner's perspective, the current owner, is some owners want th their business is their legacy, and they want this thing to continue on without them. If that's what they want, this is a great choice. If someone's looking just to flip it over to a competitor and take money, run, and go down to Florida, and you don't have to work the business, this is probably not the right strategy for them. It works for some companies, not for others. We find um, it works the best for those who want to keep the group together. And, and when we're doing a transaction, when we're representing the participants in the initial purchase, <coughs> we want to make sure that the structure is such that it's, it can be sustainable into the future. Um, really, the key for us in the name of the game is sustainability. Well, and Steve kind of mentioned uh, maybe companies that aren't good candidates. Could you elaborate on maybe some of the things that don't the candidates that don't work for this type of plan? Absolutely, good question. So uh, not every company is a good candidate for an ESOP. And, and so things, in addition to simply situations that may be the opposite of what you see on the board here, uh, you know, things to think about what wouldn't be a good candidate, uh, certainly a company that's too small, uh, if you don't have enough employees or enough free cash flow. Um, you know, we, we came across one not too long ago, uh, the, so speculative real estate investments, probably not a good uh, ESOP-owned company. Uh, we had one in, in Florida where an uh, uh, individual bought an island. It was a small island off the coast of Florida. It was very pretty. Um, but they wanted, so they built a little marina for their yacht and their friends' yachts, and they built a little restaurant and a hotel, and, and they uh, decided, well, this, not only is this a, a beautiful place for us to hang out, but what if we sold it to an ESOP and didn't pay any taxes? And that was the whole motivation. Well, the island was worth about $50 million, but there were only 10 employees. Um, but the company didn't make any money. It was really just a lifestyle investment. Well, um, you know, one 20-something decided he was going to leave, and all of a sudden they had to pay him, you know, his 10% of that $50 million, and they didn't have any cash flow, and they couldn't honor that repurchase obligation. Uh, we had another one that was uh, a speculative uh, oyster farm in the Gulf that would buy land for oyster farming rights, and I guess the whole investment thesis is if you buy it really close to a BP oil well and you hope that they spill oil and they'll give you a big check, that's not a good business model for an ESOP. 
<laughs> I'm yeah, sure you two have seen plenty yeah, of them. We recently, and maybe you're referring to this, but we recently had a um, potential ESOP company come to us and they had one client, one customer. They made a lot of money off that one customer, but it was a like a five-year contract, and at the end of the five years, we weren't sure, sure if that contract was going to renew. So we actually respectfully declined to move forward with an ESOP transaction after we did initial feasibility with actually your firm, Michael. But I would say that is one thing to think. If you think of it as a retirement plan and approach it from the, would this be a prudent investment for a retirement plan? That'll typically answer, is this a good candidate for an ESOP or not? There are pros and cons to ESOPs. So uh, we're not here to tell you that it's, that it's all perfect and, and so forth. We want to talk about a balanced approach. It's not right for everyone. Uh, for those that it is right for, it can be very good. Uh, for those that it doesn't work for, maybe not so much. And so, you know, in terms of pros and cons for, for ESOPs, you know, some of the things that um, you know, we talk about from a transaction perspective, selling to an ESOP is a much more controllable transaction. So, Chirsty, as a trustee, you're acting as the buyer. Right. Would you say you approach it differently than a private equity firm or an outside buyer would to, to a sale? We do. I mean, the industry is always changing, but we typically don't do the level of due diligence that other buyers do. Um, we rely on reps and warranties made by the sellers um, or the company um, to support our decision-making process. But I think what we're finding along the way is that we're actually doing more and more research and doing uh, a little bit, uh, you know, digging into companies a, a little bit further before we make that, that decision. Um, we, we like to say we don't do a colonoscopy of the company like maybe another buyer would do, but we're starting to kind of move in that direction. It is an internal sale, and so I think the level of diligence requirements is, is different. Um, you know, the timeline for a transaction is shorter. These are things that can be done in a couple of months. Uh, so in terms of disruption to your business, it's something that uh, may not be as disruptive as an outside sale. Uh, it, it may be more controllable. Um, you know, it, it, Stephen mentioned something that's very important about preserving culture uh, through a transition. And, and also, uh, we're going to talk about, we're actually going to get into some financing stuff here in a second and, and how the financing works. But I also wanted to cover some of the cons, you know, things that there may be some perceived complexity to ESOPs. Uh, I, I'm not sure that they're necessarily that much more complex than uh, every every business has to transition its ownership, uh, you know, and and so uh, I'm not sure that it's necessarily that much more complex. But maybe there's more of a lack of knowledge, as as John said, about about how it works, and so that perceived lack of um, you know or the complexity that you think about with an ESOP uh, may just be from lack of experience. And generally, when, with an ESOP, you have a partner, an, an additional right. partner in the ESOP. And so a lot of times, we'll ask for enhanced corporate governance. Like, we might want an independent board member to sit on the board. That just gives us some assurances that um, if the um, person that's running the company, the CEO, maybe he's also the selling shareholder, or she's also the selling shareholder, if they get hit by the proverbial bus, we want some sort of independent party to be able to say, um, in order to keep the investment in the ESOP um, safe and, and running the way it should, We'd like some independence to say this is who should then take over and run the company. There's no clear succession um, plan. Hopefully they're working on developing one. Um, but that's usually a change when an ESOP uh, is put in, is that you have this partner and we ask for this added layer of, of governance. There's also ongoing cost. It has to be administered, valued. Um, you know, the, there is some ongoing cost to having an ESOP. Uh, there is repurchase obligation, so the company has to plan for how it's going to repurchase shares from departing participants. Uh, so these are things that you want to think about and understand as you're going into the process, and, and you know some of the things we wanted to highlight as part of that. Um, we, th we think of ESOP transactions as, as a balancing approach between uh, potentially some competing issues, and so you have this internal sale uh, with different parties that may have, in some ways, aligned and in some ways not aligned interests. Uh, and so you're, you're looking at both the seller's interests, the company's interests, uh, the employee's interests, and how do you strike a balance between all of those things? And I think in ESOP's a way to help 
um, accomplish these things, and we, we find that they're, they're very um, you know, good at providing tax-efficient uh, ownership transition liquidity to the seller, to providing value to the employees over time, and um, you know, in, in especially in the case of the 100% owned uh, ESOP that's an S corporation, uh, you know, a structural advantage uh, for the company, uh, as well as some of the cultural benefits. Um, we see performance benefits over time. Uh, those are especially pronounced in companies that have good communication uh, and, and reinforce uh, the benefits to their employees and communicate that well. Uh, and I don't know if you want to just elaborate on some of the other you know, structural issues with, with ESOPs and, and the balancing from you know, what you see as you know, advising them. Um. Well, on the implementation stage, typically we would have um, a trustee would require employment agreements of the key employees. Um, s closely held businesses a lot of times don't have working boards. Um, they don't have working board minutes. They don't even know what a board of directors is. Um, so there's a lot of corporate <laughs> governance work that would go on um, to ex explain how a, what a corporate board is and how it should be functioning and it should be meeting once a year and reviewing what's going on because a trustee will want to have a functioning board in, in place. Um, so from a corporate governance perspective, some companies have it, some don't. Um, those that don't, it's something not difficult to put in, but it's part of the ESOP implementation process. A lot of times we'll start out, they don't even have any corporate records. We'll have to get a copy of the certificate of corporation from Secretary of State and then uh, put in new bylaws. Um, and do affidavits of stock certificates. No one can even find the stock certificates, okay? Um, that's not unusual in small companies. Um, but it doesn't mean that just because you don't have it that we can't implement it and put it in if um, everything else works for them. Yeah. And, and then as Chris pointed out um, in the first session, communication is key with the participants. Um, it's not once and done. It's usually continuous. And if you can um, keep the ESAP uh, word alive throughout the company, throughout the organization, um, the participants tend to understand and appreciate the ESAP more, and that tends to, um, again, uh, get everyone rowing in the same, same direction. So now we're going to start with the, what we titled the program, <coughs> talk about financing. So uh, it is a corporate transaction. We, uh, that's, that's part of the role that we play in, in raising capital and helping to fund and structure an ESOP transaction. And I can tell you that um, you know, we've seen more interest from outside financing parties uh, in the last year than we have in, in my career. And so there is an abundance of capital available to help businesses today. Um, I know there, uh, Webster Bank is in the room. Uh, they're a, senior lender here in New York that have done a number of uh, successful ESOP transactions. Uh, there, there is a lot of, like I said, there is a lot of capital to help facilitate these transactions and people who understand uh, ESOPs and businesses and how to fund them. Um, that's going to be your cheapest source of capital and, and I would say you know, most every ESOP transaction that we're looking at is involving you know, some level of, of outside capital uh, at the point of closing. Uh, I would say back in 2009, uh, almost, if not every single one, uh, was purely seller financed. It was a more difficult uh, financing time. Uh, but, but now is a great time to sell your business. Uh, multiples are up. There's an abundance of capital for financing. Uh, and so uh, we're looking at, at putting in a lot of um, senior bank financing into these transactions. What that also does is, is so if you're selling 100% of your business, uh, you as the seller can help finance that through seller notes. And having that senior lender in front of you gives you, one, some liquidity at closing. So you, you get that uh, cash out of the business up front. What it also does is as you're deleveraging and you're paying off that debt, it now gives you a vehicle and a partner who can help re-up on that financing. And so every few years as you're paying down the debt, they'll take a bigger slice of it. And it helps accelerate the liquidity to you as, as the seller uh, and getting you your capital out of the business faster and at a lower cost. 
Uh, we've also seen a number of um, private equity, uh, mezzanine funds, um, you know, sources of capital beyond that first stage senior level uh, that are allowing business owners to get quite a bit of capital out of their business at closing. Now that becomes more expensive, uh, but there, like I said, there are a number of sources of, of mezzanine junior capital that understand ESOPs and ESOP businesses uh, that are willing to lend into those transactions. And it minimizes how much the seller has to take. Now it may be advantageous for a seller to take more of the financing. You know, where else are you going to get the kinds of returns that you can get in financing your own business in the public market? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, uh, we see some sellers that say, I'm getting such a good return out of my business, I, I want to do 100% of the financing myself. And, and that's perfectly fine. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of sources of capital. There's also internal sources. So company balance sheet as well as uh, other retirement accounts. So we see companies using uh, 401ks as, as methods of uh, financing a transaction as well. And so there's a lot of, like I said, options, flexibility, uh, sources of capital to help uh, finance the transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, oh, I was going to say, so I know um, we're right under 15 minutes and um, we did want to get to some of the litigation, but maybe if you both want to wrap up some of your, your thoughts, we can get to, the, get to that. Uh, I was just going to comment on the financing that um, you know we we assess anything that we're approached with, and typically as long as it makes sense, we're looking at market type rates. Um, you know, as a trustee, uh, we we don't have a, a preference necessarily, but I will say any any one of us that lived through the 08, 09, 2010 period, we do kind of like seller financing because we um, kind of inherently feel that it gives us more flexibility should uh, a company not per perform so well. So. Uh, it, we, we can't like ascribe any, I guess, benefit to it monetarily, but to us it does um, give us a little bit of comfort knowing that there is added flexibility with seller financing deals. So, of the deals that you're doing these days, how many are using outside capital? Um, that is actually shifted. Um, so like you said, back in 2009, it was almost all seller finance deals. The capital from uh, financial institutions just wasn't there. Um, so I would say it's probably uh, close to 60, 70 percent of our deals. Are uh, involve outside financing. What about you? Um, I, I would say 50-50. Okay. Um. So um, we just had a quick diagram to show you know the way that the financing works. This, the company is really the one uh, being the guarantor of that outside debt and providing the funding to the ESOP, uh, which is uh, so so we're having the economic loan go between the company and the outside financing source, and then setting up an internal loan with the ESOP trust so that we're controlling the benefit level that gets released over time. And so as you see here, as that internal loan gets paid off between the company and the trust, that's what's releasing shares to the participants inside the ESOP and how they're being allocated stock. Uh, so there are other ways to structure things. We just this would be a primary way, and, and one that we often get asked a lot about how how does this work. Mm -hmm. So when we're first approached by a business owner and they want to talk about transitioning ownership in their business, the top two things that we want to address are what are the value. So what can an ESOP pay, and will it work? So financing, uh, valuation, and feasibility. Valuation, the ESOP can pay fair market value for the shares. We'll talk about the valuation here in a second. The feasibility really is looking at a projected cash flow and layering the transaction over it to make sure that going forward the company can finance the transaction, sustain its growth, and pay out its participants and deliver a benefit over time. How are we valuing the business? We're looking at discounted cash flow analyses, we're looking at public companies, we're looking at public market data for transactions that we can find. You know, the floor of that would be a liquidation value, which isn't really applicable. If you're becoming an ESOP, you have, uh, you have value above what you could liquidate for. So we're primarily looking at, at cash flows and looking for market data to help us set value. <laughs> There's value in 
100% of the value of the business, control versus a non-controlling interest. ESOPs, we talk about control uh, quite a bit, and, and there's value implications of that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people involved in a transaction, and the company is funding both sides of it. You're paying both for your internal advisors as well as for the transaction team, the trustee, and their advisors. And so it's important to understand who all is involved. Uh, there's a buyer and a seller, and the company's paying for all of it. One important thing to think about is the tax benefits that come post-transaction. We typically see it's about two months of tax savings is about the cost of an ESOP transaction. And so it tends to pay for itself in a, in a matter of months. All right. Well, we are getting close uh, to that 10-minute mark, so maybe we'll segue into the legal issues. Um, I know there have been some recent court case settlements. Uh, could you maybe, Stephen, talk about you know, what are the takeaways from those cases, maybe right. some of the trends that you're seeing? Oh, okay. So let me talk about it in terms of the trends um, rather than discussing each case specifically. The law says, the, the Department of Labor regulations say that the ESOP has to pay, can't pay more than fair market value on the day that you close. So you need an appraisal on the day that you close, okay? No one should sell to an ESOP for a value that's higher than what they truly believe is correct, okay? It's something you definitely should not do. Um, you can pay fair, you can sell for fair market value, um, but, but you shouldn't sell it for more. And a number of cases involve what that is. So in, in the past, um, uh, the, the appraisers used to work for the business owner and then they would shift over to the trustee side, okay, and then give the opinion to the trustee. Well, that's no longer um, going to happen due to the um, a case settlement um, involving Aluminum Sierra, okay. So now you don't have Aluminum Sierra. Sierra Aluminum. Sierra Aluminum, yeah. Sierra Aluminum yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, so as a result of that case, there's no a uh, bank trustee in this country that will allow an appraiser to, to switch sides going from the um, seller over to the buyer. But there's another thing that's going on. It's with the Department of Labor. And instead of issuing a regulation telling us what the, the rules are, they kind of are putting forth in a litigation position what they want to see and don't want to see. And they've taken uh, the position in a number of cases where you have people who organize these deals, they call themselves quarterbacks or financial quarterbacks. Typically, they tend to be investment bankers. And they say, give us a fee, and we're going to go pay for everybody. We'll pay for your side. We'll hire the lawyer. We'll pay them. We'll hire your, we'll be your investment advisor. And then we're also going to hire the trustee. We'll pay the trustee. We'll pay the trustee's lawyer. And we'll pay the trustee's appraiser, OK? and the investment banker gets a fee contingent on closing. All right? The Department of Labor doesn't like that approach. Why? Because they say that the trustee and the trustee's team is not independent when they are being paid for by an agent who's putting the deal together. Right. And there's a number of people out there that are collecting a fee. It's kind of common sense in some ways. You wouldn't see that in a non-ESOP transaction. Like if you sold to a third party or private equity, you're not going to have your banker pay for the buyer's lawyer, okay, as one example. It just doesn't happen, right. all right? So there's that conflict. Is it illegal according to the case law? The answer is no. There's not a case on that. But it's the Department of Labor's position that this is not something that they like, and they, they are argued in court and are arguing in court that the trustee is not independent when um, their advisors are being paid by um, someone who's paid for uh, on the seller side as a condition of the deal closing. And that's where we're seeing most of the um, kind of the highlight of the litigation issues. And I guess, um, you know, in light of that litigation, right. and you might have already sort of answered part of this question, but what type of investment banker would you encourage clients to hire? Um, in light of this. <laughs> okay. Well, it's like anything else is um, you, you know it's right in your gut with, when they're doing something that feels right to you, okay? okay. All right? It's like searching anything, buying anything else. I mean, are they, do they have experience in their area? Are they coming up with values that are realistic? Right. Are, you, are you selling it for the right reason 
doing these stuff. This is not something, an area where you want to go and sell your business for twice the value because someone has some scheme and some people he knows that he thinks he can get you that price. Okay? Right. You're going to wind up in trouble. All right. Well, I think um, that is a good place to stop and start asking questions. Um, so we discussed, I think this kind of was touched upon in the last panel, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about proposed tax changes and how that might impact ESOPs right now. There, there's a proposal on the Hill regarding S-corporations and deferring taxes. Um, and then, you know, with broader tax reform in general, um, obviously the net investment income tax looks like it could go away under that, um, which is part of capital gains. Um, so maybe discussing those those two things. Right. Well, we, we, I think that was touched on by earlier panelists. Right, the capital gains. The 3.8% tax doesn't apply in the sale of business stock. Um, do I think we're going to have ultimately some level of lower tax at the federal level? The answer is yes. Okay, how much? I don't think it's going to be anything close to what has been proposed uh, by Trump. There's other issues he's dealing with. He pulled out of the climate thing today um, with Paris. Um, he's building a wall in Mexico, maybe getting to war with North Korea. You know, he's got a lot of distractions. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Russia, you know, Iran. Um, he's got a lot on his plate. And uh, tax reform is not really the, the, the first thing. And um, the important thing is we're in a climate right now, as a result of the 2009 recession, a lot of businesses got weeded out. A lot of competition went, went away. The economy came back, and those businesses that were left got very big and profitable. And valuations are very high right now. The stock market is a very high multiple compared to the historical trends. Okay? You got a lot of bank and alternative financing available that we didn't have. All those things right now we're seeing come together. It's a great time for business owners to sell their businesses getting really high multiples. You can borrow money at low interest rates. There's a lot of money out there if you wanted to do it. Um, will there be some lower taxes in the future? Probably yes. Is it affecting people? I haven't seen it. Okay. And then with the S-Corp proposal, I know that's been, it's a separate legis piece of legislation, but they've discussed maybe including this in broad reform. As we know, that may or may not happen. But maybe could you discuss that proposal on its own um, and how that would impact? I, I, I am not aware of any serious proposal that any serious tax advisor thinks that the taxation of S corporations is going to uh, radically change from where it is. In fact, it, over time, it's, it's, it's become much more beneficial um, in that you have m many more people own S corporation stock. You used to have a few, and now you have this exception, that exception. The ESOP is included treated as one shareholder, even though they could have tons of beneficial shareholders. The IRS even bent over backwards with some private letter ruling to allow uh, when you distribute stock, you're not getting into two classes of stock. Um, so on the tax regulatory front with the S-Corp ESOP, um, the coast is clear right now. Yeah, so there are two issues there. There's the issue of <coughs> Extending the 1042 capital gain tax deferral to S corporations, and there's the issue of will the tax benefit uh, to S corps go away? And I've not heard any um, real movement on either of those things. I, I would not expect S corps to have the 1042 election option anytime soon. I also would not expect them to lose the tax benefit of the uh, ESOP going forward. All right, fair enough. Okay, so I think uh, we have two minutes left. Okay. Right. So the oh. question, correct me if I summarize this incorrectly, you said, can you address some of the tax issues between a C-Corp and an S-Corp related to ESOPs? Yeah, with, with emphasis on smaller companies. I, I know one of the, I guess it's really kind of two questions. One, um, some, of the, some of the speakers mentioned that there's working kind of smaller companies and startups that are going into ESOPs. Um, in your experience, are, is, is it better for those companies to elect S-Corp status or or doing an ESOP, or is it better for them to stay in the 
C Corp and lower the, the relative financing considerations um, in the C Corp and S Corp? Well, so the, the question being, what are the relative differences uh, between C Corp and S Corp as it relates to ESOPs? And one is on the sale of a company, the 1042 capital gains deferral option is only available to a C corporation. Going forward, if you are a C corporation, you're taxed at the corporate level, um, and you are 100% ESOP owned, you may be missing a big tax advantage in that a pass-through entity uh, at 100% is being passed through to a tax-exempt trust. And so that ESOP tax-exempt trust, um, when it becomes 100% owned means that you're not paying federal and state income tax. And so that's the, the big benefit on, on the going forward side. So there's the, uh, on the sale of the company, if you're the seller, there's the potential to defer capital gains in a C corporation. Going forward, uh, you have this owner that's a tax exempt trust, why not pass through the taxation to a tax exempt trust instead of paying it at the corporate level? Yeah, let me just follow up. If you start out as a C, you can always elect S. If you were an S, you got to wait five years to go re-elect S. Okay, but the, the trade-off is um, we used to see a lot more C corp deals where people would elect 1042. We're seeing a lot less because, um, as jo John Vitucci uh, mentioned earlier, w when you're an S corp and you don't elect 1042, you can participate in the plan. And there's ways you can design the plan so that the sellers can own a good chunk of the company going forward. So if you think the company's got a rosy future, um, you might be better off as a plan participant. Um, and it's really a design criteria. It's something that can take a couple of meetings back and forth and some spreadsheeting to figure out what's best in a particular client situation. Right. I think that's uh, Do we have time for one more question? Or are we? Does it make sense to add that it's not often known that S corporations can be very large companies because the ESOP trust itself is a single shareholder. So the usual <coughs> understanding that you S corps are only for small companies with ESOP doesn't apply. Right, right. So for those who didn't hear, uh, an important thing is that the ESOP trust is the sole shareholder. And so it counts as one shareholder, and, and you don't have, it's not the number of participants that count toward the 100 shareholder rule. I wanted to say thank you to our last panelists. Thank you. Uh, thanks all. Uh, just to wrap up very quickly, I'd like to invite Al Fiore, a partner with PKF O'Connor Davis, to, just to make a few closing remarks. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you all for coming. Special thanks for those who are standing in the back or on the sidelines. We'll make sure next time that we have more, a little more tables. Uh, you know, on behalf of our co-sponsors, our guest speakers, uh, the team from, B from BNA, uh, for a most informative um, program on the usefulness of the use of ESOPs uh, for both owners, shareholders, and the employees. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Yeah, sure. Yeah, th thanks to um, our sponsors, uh, to our outside experts, and most importantly to all of you for coming. Uh, I'm sure there are, you have more questions. We do now have a networking reception, and many of our speakers, I hope, will be in the networking reception too, so do take your questions along to them. That's going to be the next room. Thanks for coming. <laughs>